Well, thank you. <clears throat> this is exciting today. I'm Jessica Swain Bradway, Midwest PBIS Network. This is one of uh, the next webinar in our series of School Climate Transformation Grant webinars. Uh, typically, I am introducing others, but today I'm actually introducing myself and my very capable team that's joining me. We're going to talk about restorative practices in school-wide PBS, um, this integration and alignment and some things to think about. Um, as a reminder, all of our webinars are recorded. Uh, the University of Oregon team works very hard to get them edited and posted on the pbis.org website. Um, and uh, they are available as well as the PowerPoint uh, for viewing and later on, and you can use it as a resource. Helping me out today to uh, make sure all of this runs smoothly is Anthony Raj from University of Oregon, Brian Meyer, and Diane Lamaster from Midwest PBIS. Uh, I want to make it a point, uh, there are a lot of contributions on this front slide. I want to make a point to say um, uh, that this work is truly, truly collaborative work. There are a lot of folks um, that have contributed in one way, shape, or form. Um, I am extremely grateful that they're willing to uh, participate and collaborate with me. And um, as we get started, uh, I see people are already engaging in our first poll, who is on the webinar today. Um, if you can't see all the options, go ahead and scroll up and down. Hopefully you can see that pretty well. Um, it, it sounds like it looks okay for people. Uh, we got a lot of coaches on the call, some administrators, welcome. Administrators are people too, we love you too. I'm just joking. Uh, hopefully you've been on a webinar with me before you realize that the, the bad humor will persist throughout. Um, got some restorative coaches and then some some other, some people in other roles. If, if you are someone who picked other, please do type in that sign in and comments pod, uh, which is down below on the right. You see a green arrow pointing to it so that I have a fuller picture of who's on the call. Um, as we go throughout our webinar today, I my expectation is that all of you will ask questions and share comments. Uh, make sure your phones are on mute so we don't hear any of that background chatter about your weekend, although that's very exciting for you. Uh, but let's keep the background a chatter down by hitting mute on our phones. Um, and please do ask questions, comments in this, this pod, the sign in and comments here pod. All of our polls will show up right above that where you can see the poll right now. Um, and got a little bit of feedback, make sure that your phone is on mute. If you call in just via phone, your phone isn't muted unless you do it, okay? So thank you so much. Here is our agenda. Um, we're gonna talk really briefly as, an, as a background. I know some of you have been on calls and webinars with me before. Some of you are, are part of the community of practice for restorative practices. Um, and uh, we have talked about some of these things. We know on the, on the school climate webinars, we get a whole range of adult learners engaging and sharing. And that's really helpful. That also means that I share examples and information that are going to span a broad range of topics. Some are applicable and some are not. So please do ask those questions. When we're engaging and asking questions, we're going to, we're going to learn more. Uh, we are going to talk about this intersection of school-wide PBS and restorative practices. And for those of you that are um, just getting started with this, uh, I need you to pick up a few pieces you can take back to your teams and administrators and have those conversations or the district to have those conversations because some of the things we do in restorative, oh yeah, we got an aware state coordinator, awesome. Uh, thanks for joining, Marco. Um, uh, some of those conversations that we have around restorative require policy changes, FTE allocation, so teacher time, different resources allocation, all the way down to the, the interactions we have with our kids and our and our uh, as teachers and grown-ups uh, administrators. So the the interactions, the practices are facilitated by all those other pieces that we need to build as well. Um, and yes, I'm preaching to the choir. I want you to really uh, have a very strong message to take back to your stakeholders and be, be able to communicate this with families and uh, students and the community uh, participants. I do have some really nice exemplars to share. You probably, uh, if you've been on calls before, you may have heard these before. Please do ask questions and poke holes in these. We have one from elementary school and one from a middle school. 
And then some general recommendations from the field. Now the field is fairly loose at this point. We are all working hard across restorative world and PBS world to bring that field uh, together and get more evidence-based um, uh, documentation for restore the impact of restorative on student outcomes. Uh, here are our objectives. I want you to all be able to take away a few cautions and things to think about. The recommendations that come from full disclosure, the recommendations come from what myself and other technical assistance providers in both PBS and restorative practices, what we are collectively seeing is working for districts, um, as well as some alignment recommendations that actually come from the mental health alignment work that we're seeing, if you're familiar with the interconnected systems framework. One way to think about restorative practices is, uh, is nested within the interconnected system framework or the mental health integration frame because it allows those the relationship building, facilitates relationship building and very obvious attention toward relationships. And we all know on this call the importance of relationships, not only in facilitating uh, interventions for children, but in having difficult conversations between adults when we need to identify our strengths and weaknesses as a school and a team. Um, I'd like it, I want you to be thinking about how to assess the impact of restorative practices. Here's a hint, if you're assessing the impact of PBIS, you're already on your way. And then some recommendations uh, for addressing fidelity, okay? So here's our next poll. What is, ooh, what is your current experience with restorative practices. The poll is open. The results should be broadcast. Go ahead and let me know. It's over here. Okay, we have one participant. Great job, whoever participated first. You get to have another sip of that delicious coffee that you're drinking this morning. Although I've heard people don't drink coffee. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Great. Ooh, so we have a substantial portion of folks right now that have attended multiple trainings. That is really good. That's really good. Reading is also great too. I love reading. I actually read all the time. Okay, if you selected other about how your experience in restorative, again, please put that in the chat pod so that I can see that. Um, how else you've, you've heard about or interacted with this? Uh, for example, I'm working with a district where the community members brought it to the district and said, this is something that we need to do. And, and that was how things were kind of generated. Now, something to keep in mind, I'm not just asking you this so I can create relevant examples as we go throughout, though that's very important. Uh, I want you to take away things that are meaningful to you and your team. But the other reason I'm asking is because within, within our multi-tiered frame, within our triangle, our rationale is that we increase the dosage and the specificity of interventions. Um, that is, we anticipate a certain proportion of kiddos will need secondary interventions that are built on our, our universal or tier one foundations. And then we anticipate there's a much smaller proportion of kiddos and grown-ups at the top of that triangle who have needs in some area that will be uh, best supported through a very high level of individualized interventions. Okay, so while I just described our schools, I'm also describing our adults and us as learners. Depending on your level of experience with restorative and the fluency within your schools or district, you will need more or less support from an outside entity, correct? You work to build capacity within your district and you may pull people in from the outside to build that internal capacity but then we should have that capacity over time. We, we don't need to invite people to live with us forever uh, in our school districts. We really can build that internal capacity and the multi-tiered systems allows us to do that. Another reason I wanted to point that out, and this will link to our coaching later on, is that um, people who are delivering restorative practices and strategies within your school need the same level of support that you would give for delivering other interventions, correct? So some, a lot of classroom strategies are the things that we expect all of our teachers to do. High opportunities to respond, for, for positive, corrective, uh, positive praise, or specific praise, corrective feedback, right? 
those are things we that everyone is doing. Uh, facilitating a wraparound plan, individualized person-centered planning for a kiddo is not something all our kids do. And we have different levels of support for the people who deliver those interventions. Okay, that is something we still need to do for restorative practices. That is extremely important to make sure we're using that same coaching and training model. So let's talk about the state of, uh, of uh, restorative. Um, now, this isn't in the, I asked your experience in restorative, but if your district or school is already implementing some type of restorative practices, please let me know in that com sign in and comments here pod. Please say, yep, we're doing it. Uh, we've been talking about it a lot, so just let me know so I know who else who is actually doing it. Um, the disciplinary fed, uh, guidelines that came out from the feds last year, year and a half ago, um, were very overt in in saying to folks, you know what, we have to be positive and predictable, and uh, we want to use best practices. And they did include restorative practices as an um, quite toward the ends, but as a way to um, a kind of a promising practice for folks to use. So that was written in there. The National Educators Association in 2014 came out with a handbook uh, suggesting and promoting uh, the use of restorative amongst other things. Okay, no one, I'm going to couch that amongst other things. And we, of course, have had l large cities and districts across the country have been implementing um, and uh, really have some of them have done it for quite some time so in Denver we do have a fairly extensive restorative uh, kind of embedded within the schools and the district I see we've got so we've got our Detroit public schools has trained most of the teachers and uh, has trained the trader model I love it great start there um, four-day training for a district for David multi-year rollout and sustainability plan brilliant thank you uh, got community building circles for our teachers. I know that Vancouver is doing it. Dave, I'm, David Stanley, I'm really impressed. You say we're starting the process, and it looks like you're going at it very thoughtfully from the beginning, thinking about multi-year plan and sustainability. So excellent. So those of you who are excited and writing the chat pie right away, you are invited to lend your expertise as we go throughout and share what you're doing. That is extremely important. And while we can't have everybody's voices in the room because we have, it looks like about 50 attendees, um, that would be a little difficult to manage. The way you get to share is going to be through that sign in and comments pod. Um, and also at the, we'll have email addresses and resources at the end as well. But I want to make sure you guys know that your input is extremely important. So borrowing from the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice Project, they are the Illinois-based uh, trainer, t technical assistance providers. Um, we know to back out that restorative practices came from restorative justice. Um, so they're typically called restorative practices in schools, and it is inspired by the philosophy and practices around restorative justice with this big focus of repairing harm done to relationships and people over assigning blame. OK, so we aren't going to go down the blame game. We are really focusing on on um, repairing what needs to be repaired, particularly our relationships. And that's really important. And there's some hot links throughout this webinar if you want to copy and paste them into your, your browser there if you're looking for them. There's a there's a really big need as you start getting study getting as you get started. Um, and I say we have some book studies in here, which is a good good place to start to get people on the same page. Um, it looks like Amy Amy's sharing that Michigan passed legislation to end zero tolerance policies. I love it. And including language that schools need to uh, use RP as an alternative. That is amazing. And that's that's I love that stuff. So uh, that makes it makes makes my day when I hear that. Um, with the adoption, with the book studies, we want to make sure as we're getting training that the core messages don't get lost. And we all know. That there are places that still think PBS is hugs and cookies, that we just throw rewards at kids all the time. Everybody gets rewarded for everything instead of looking at it as a framework to install best practices or promising practices and collect data to inform implementation and to determine the impact, right? It's our it's our decision making framework. That's not how folks understand it all the time. And it's and I get it. It can be difficult to unpack. Restorative practices and restorative justice can be perceived in the same way. And this is where we need to be very, very clear with our staff 
so as you're getting started, think about, um, or as you're doing this and you're trying to refine your work, think about where your staff are understanding the difference between a retribution and restorative. Okay, so retribution is very top-down, punishment-oriented. Who broke the rules? What was the rule that was broken? What do we deserve? What's the punishment? Our traditional disciplinary systems in the country are focused on, in schools um, and federally, are focused on um, uh, punishing uh, as a, an aversive that people will avoid. We're going to avoid this aversive thing. Um, and what we know from the research on punishment is that too much punishment, if it's a high balance of punishment and it's not leveled out with uh, reinforcement and, and praise and then redirection or correction, not, not punishment, um, we know that high rates of punishment lead to uh, sneaky behavior, lying behavior, feelings of revenge, a lot of anger. Uh, through the restorative world, we talk about the feelings of shame and how shame can hinder us from learning and moving forward. Um, so it's important that uh, we think about that we have different outcomes uh, depending on our approach. And we should be very, very honest, which we need to build our relationships with staff to do this, about the difference between inflicting pain as a deterrent and re to reduce reoffending, or including students, building skills, and uh, fixing what is wrong. Okay, we have to be aware of that. So please do feel free to take these slides and grab them, um, copy and paste, and use what you need to if you want to download and use them. Uh, the goals of restorative justice in schools, this is a little bit of an older um, reference, but Simone Gonsolin is absolutely uh, very just kind and generous uh, human being and has done a lot of work, uh, particularly in juvenile justice, using um, uh, uh, restorative practices. Um, really, we want to create a restorative and inclusive climate, decrease suspensions. Sounds very much like where we go in PBS world including people who have been harmed in their surrounding community, which is different from how we typically think of the average PBS implementation, and re-engage youth that are at risk of academic failure, specifically through dialogue-driven restorative practices, restorative responses. So actually having a conversation and working through with kids. Now, if you think about this, uh, having the conversations with kids and figuring out what's going wrong, you can make parallels to what other, this is a tricky question, I'm just throwing in there, so heads up. What practices, strategies, and assessments can you think of through PBS that we talk about where um, we would engage students, their, their teachers, their parents maybe in conversation to determine what is going um, kind of wrong, what the problem is for them? I'm going to give a second. I'm going to, I want you to make a connection. I'm asking a little early. But through PBS processes, up as we go through the intensing, intensifying tiers, um, we do engage in dialogue with grown-ups and kids, sometimes kids, uh, specifically about their behavior. How do we do that? Everyone is, Amanda, you get the award. Specific praise. We give them specific praise. That is dialogue. What else? Okay, we got more people to, yeah. See, I knew if I just asked twice. Pre-correction, yep. Structure conversation about who was harmed. Tier two, check and check out. FBA, BIP. Functional assessment checklist for teachers. The facts. Ooh. I just blew at least one person's mind, just one person. So we have parallels, and I want you to think about those because we, we want to hold on to what is core and critical to the evidence-based practices and the PBS framework while we integrate our restorative practices. And if someone is selling you a restorative practice that is contraindicated or goes against what we know about behavior support that is positive and dignified, you need to create your bubble and say that's not part of what we do, right? We don't want to violate our behavioral principles by adopting other pieces. And, and for my school climate transformation grantees, you have had this conversation with your technical assistance provider or your safe and healthy student um, grant manager, 
who has said, please tell me how this is aligned because we can't do the opposite of what we said we were going to do that's good for kids, right? Okay. So I really like this graphic and I'm not sure if this came from IBARJ or IIRP, the International Institute of Restorative Practices. I'm gonna give credit to both of them because they're both fabulous. This is really what we see a lot, this tale of two schools, okay? And thanks, Diane, for making sure that people know the PowerPoint will be posted. Um, I will email that to Anthony uh, as soon as we're done so he can get it posted up there for us. Um, we often see this, a tale of two schools, the zero tolerance education system. And even when we say we're not gonna do zero tolerance anymore, we find ways to do this, right? So we're not just talking about our policies, we're talking about shifting to an inclusive uh, environment where you really think about, um, for my folks who do tier three level work, um, where we have that at, stay at the table mentality, but we are always at that table for that student, for the family to come back and problem solve. And we don't, we don't tell them they can't come back. We don't tell them we're done caring about them. We stay at the table. So we have this, um, this kind of picture of two different uh, systems. And um, we may also have a picture of two different classrooms, right? Uh, yes, yes, we, everybody's nodding vehemently. And often in our high schools, uh, and sometimes in our middle schools, especially for our eighth graders, they're not nearly as cuddly anymore. We see this difference. And, and I, I need to impress upon you the need to have consistency or fidelity of adult behaviors because I can walk into my math class that has a very restorative, inclusive feel. It's safe for me to make mistakes, right? And so I make them and I learn and I grow. I grow in my ability to manage myself as a learner and I grow in my math ability. And then I go into my biology class and I'm stifled, which means not only do I not get the chance to grow as, as a learner or grow in my knowledge of biology, I also create uh, maybe sh a momentum of shame and feeling bad about myself, right? Okay, so Diane, raise your hand. Diane, I, uh, if you could, or Danielle, if you can write in the chat pod, that would be great because I don't have a way to turn on individual microphones. It would just be chaos. So please uh, raise your hand in up here in the menu bar if you are familiar with the social discipline window, please. Okay, Cindy, oh yes. People are listening. I was gonna say, who wants to win a million dollars? Yes, look at all of you. Okay, it looks like we had about 15 people that are familiar with. This is really great. This is one of those Im really important uh, lenses for us to look through uh, as it applies to restorative. And it also applies to positive behavior supports. And think about this, our programming to generalize, teaching to generalization. Hmm, another parallel. Bill's thinking about it. He's going to type something really smart in that chat pod. I know it, Bill. Our social discipline window, we talk about changing and supporting behaviors. We have this limit setting or discipline, low limit setting to high, and then low support to high support. And our goal, if, if we have high support, I mean, high control, but no support, we're doing something to people. If it's low control and low support, we're neglecting them. If it's high support, but low limit setting, we're just letting them do whatever, right? Now I want you to think about this. <laughs> yeah, Bill says this, that was smart, Bill, good job. I know you were sweating a little bit. The window is a great way to think about how, for adults to think about how their interactions impact kids and what they're actually doing. It's also a way for us to think about how we interact with our coworkers. I want you to continue to make these parallels between the systems and practices we use to support our adults and the systems and practices we use to adult support our children, our students, because they are they're this, right? We're really looking to get to this with, okay? Think about through uh, best practices in classroom instruction. We do, I do it for you, I do it with you, you do it, right? I do, we do, you do. Model, lead, test. We're moving towards with, and then we say fly, fly, little butterfly, don't we? Okay, so this is a really great way to think about where we're going and the parallels between our a philosophy of a restorative and our approach in school-wide PBS. 
you are allowed, all of you, at any point in time to type into the chat pod about how amazing I am this Thursday morning. I am very good at soliciting specific praise. My parents taught me. I want to talk about shame for a little bit. I want us to uh, namely put this in our, in our cap, uh, put it in our pocket to think about the way we shame children and how, how hard that is for them to recover from. Um, <laughs> I'm cracking the up this morning. I love it. I, okay. I have feather my cap for that. Um, uh, shame is extremely difficult. We, it's a very hard emotion for us to carry. And we actually avoid, we tend to avoid people, um, and events that make us feel ashamed. I, I personally really enjoy challenges and things I haven't tried before. And, and it's, it's funny to me. I laugh about, uh, you know, my mistakes and, and there we go. Um, I don't, I don't feel a lot of shame because I'm a, I'm a human being. Again, I had great parents. I'm fairly well adjusted. What we know about shame for, and in restorative practices, they talk about a, saying, yes, people have shame. We have to avoid it and we have to acknowledge what it can do to the relationship building and learning environment, okay? So we may attack others. We may withdraw. We may attack ourselves, right? develop self-harm approaches, not taking care of ourselves and neglecting our own health. Um, we may deny. None of these things put us in a position to engage in learning. Um, you know, from the restorative perspective, shame inhibits our ability to connect, learn, and then engage. We know if we look at the punishment literature, exclusion does not build skills. Punishment and exclusion can exacerbate the social problems as well as make it less likely children and parents will be willing to engage. To move this work forward, we truly have to uh, acknowledge that our discipline practices and systems are often designed to intentionally create shameful, angry feelings. That, that is, we are intentionally doing that. And we want to be able to have those conversations with grownups. From an ethical, restorative, physiological, or positive behavior perspective, that is not work. Physiologically, we know. When we feel stress, our cortisol increases. It actually, it, we are, our um, breathing gets shallow, which means we have less oxygen to our brain. We are actually physically less capable of engaging in the learning process and of, of really being present in that moment and learning. We are, we are on our way to fight or flight. Okay, so that's a lot of, of stuff about restorative talking points about restorative and kind of the. Um, emphasis or the rationale for why we would do it. So I want everybody to just take a second. I want you to type in the in the sign in and comments pod. Uh, if anything in the past uh, 20 minutes really stood out to you as an important talking point for your staff, your administration, or your community members. So just take a second. Thank you, Amanda. Good, we got lots of people typing. Yes, too much punishment can lead to shame. Yes, square is a good, powerful. Yep, good, good, good. Yes, Amanda, you nailed it. Uh, that shame and reactions to shame are misinterpreted as naughty behavior, right? Aren't they? Instead of acknowledging that someone is is really in a place of suffering where they're not able to engage in the learning process. Good, I love it. So here we have uh, my my brief rant on restorative practices. Um, I am, am all in, and we still have a lot of work to do in the research world. So my researchers that are on the call and my folks that are in charge of the district level of data collection, I need you to collect really good data on what you're doing and the impact it's having. Because as of 2013, there was a West Ed study where they interviewed something like 65 people who are um, experts in multi-tiered systems, restorative practices. And what they found is that there is no common definition or understanding of how we, what we say restorative is. And we don't have a National Technical Assistance Center yet in restorative practices like we do in PBIS. So in PBIS world, we want replicable. We have to measure it. We're going to count, see, observe. That's very behavioral. That isn't the approach that we have, we have come into restorative with. Um, the International Institute of Restorative Practices, I am really enjoying working with their team. Keith Hickman is the continuing 
is the is director of continuing education, and he is just a fabulous human being, very smart. Um, we are working together on integrating the two in one of our school climate sites. Very excited to get that's been going moving forward. We're going to roll out with the schools in May. Um, they have a randomized control trial underway in Pittsburgh right now. It's funded through the National Institute of Justice. Um, and they are learning a great deal. And we're rolling that into this replication that we're going to be doing in one of our school climate sites. Um, so that is very exciting. So this is a promising practice versus evidence-based. And I want you to have that information so you can share. There are th efforts underway to do this, and we can use our PBS frame to help us gather the data that are necessary. So I talked a lot about this. I'm not going to belabor this point. This, these slides here will be um, uh, available for you to download from pbis.org um, fairly shortly. We really have this response to zero tolerance. Um, we want to provide alternatives for our grown-ups. We know that school-wide PBS provides um, evidence and strategies and decision-making frame for our grown-ups to re-engage students by teaching them through instruction. We essentially say all of PBS is teach, practice, reinforce. And we get very, very specific on the things and the ways that we do that, right? You can see we have a shout out. Michelle Hammond is third district is working closely with IRP. I love it. Restorative provides a range of promising practices that draw our attention to relationship building, delivering non-contingent attention. Think about that way circles, non-contingent, positive attention from others. Whereas we use contingent attention a lot of times as a teaching tool in uh, PBIS. We put our attention on built relationship building and repair. In some ways, I think restorative creates the expectation at the larger district level and school level. We really are rethinking our discipline in a way that helps us maintain student and grown-up dignity and facilitates a positive relationship. We're working toward that positive whole school climate. So um, Mr. Hickman, Keith, and I, um, uh, in our collaborations with the school, this is the informal to formal continuum that we see in restorative practices and how we move through that formal process to a more formal conference where we have multiple adults involved, bring the, the students, the families, et cetera. And within our classrooms and schools moving from informal, we have our proactive classroom strategies that are a foundation everyone uses. And we reteach and increase, right? So we're using reteaching and increasing up here. And then we have this referral process or problem solving process. Office referrals are not an intervention. They are an invitation to problem solve outside of the classroom with additional grown-ups. Okay. And that becomes then our team problem solving. So we have some parallels. We have our kind of team approach to formal conferencing. It's not just one person sitting down with the student, multiple perspectives. And we also have that for team problem solving within our school-wide frame. So I wanted to make this very clear. We have these parallel processes, these things that are going on that fit very nicely with one another. And we're not going to throw away function-based person-centered approaches, right, when we have a formal conference. In fact, like I said before, we can use the formal conference, even prompt to conversations, to get information about maintaining function when problem behaviors are repeated. Okay, so we're doing a little marriage here. I'm going to skip over this one right now. I'd like to know what resources people are using, ooh, not doing so well, to, re, to guide the work in your schools right now. So take a second. Tell me what you're doing to provide support to your uh, implementers. Ongoing training, using online resources, using books. Nobody chose making it up. Oh, that's funny. I'll pick that one. <clears throat> but Amanda's making an, an excellent point while folks are responding to the poll, is that um, uh, you have to build the foundations for the restorative work, just like you have to do with PBIS. Um, it's not going to be really easy for me to know what to do as a student um, if you, out of nowhere, I get pulled into a conference with a, an administrator who expects me to open up about my feelings and talk about what I was thinking at the time. I don't know. What the hell? What do you think? I'm thinking anything. 
I'm going into something very cold and not practiced. Um, like tier two interventions don't just happen. They happen in the classroom as tier one. We increase them in the classroom and then we invite someone to help the team to help problem solve a tier two and it's an extra dosage. Um, good. I'm so glad that Audrey said we're collecting our own data on on um, student behavior. That's a great resource, right? Is it is it working? So beautiful. This, these are great. OK, so what I've been talking about is really using the school wide PBIS frame and really thinking through the details of how you do this, this so it's aligned. And I don't want your teachers to be working it out on their own. I want you, I'm pointing to all of you, your district team preferably and your school teams to be thinking about what all of this looks like together, right? It's really, it's just heck on those teachers when we say go do this thing and you'll figure out how to do it. Right, which is why we create lesson plans for tier one. We have pre-service, we have professional development on how to do expectation, you know, teach expectations and reinforcers. Our data are really important to tell us about what we need. And I'm really glad that, let's see, make it the name correct, that Audrey, said, who said that? Amanda said, um, we have to be focused on how strong our tier one is. So I can promise you, promise you, as a technical assistance provider and coach, don't have the data yet. If you don't have foundations in your classrooms and in your schools for best practices, restorative will do very, very little to change the climate of your school as a whole. Okay, It will not have the, the impact that you're hoping to have as a school-wide system. Okay. So our data tell us what we need, and that should be the link to our practices. The data are the link, right? What do we need to do? What? Oh my gosh, they're not getting this thing, and these are the skills that we're going to teach. Okay, these are the skills. This is what we're doing here. We wouldn't just adopt a remedial reading program in a school or a classroom unless we had evidence that a proportion of our kiddos needed that. So while restorative may be the next sexy thing, um, you may find at this point, your district doesn't need it. That your PBS practices, your community that you've built, the climate you have in your school is exactly what you need it to be. That's a hard conversation to have when people are really gung-ho. If you have school improvement plan or district improvement plan that includes safety, feelings of belonging, community engagement, family engagement, hmm. Those are the, the data that you have are telling you that's important and you have those goals. Now you have that clear link between your valued outcomes, the data you're collecting, and the practices you're putting in place. There needs to be that continuity there. Okay. And remember within our PBS systems that we are we increase dosage as we go up the triangle of strategies, right? The strategies are increasingly have dosed up. I like the dosage analogy. It makes a lot of sense to me. So take a second, because we haven't given feedback for a second. Uh, oh, I keep forgetting I have to do this. Um, which, oh, that's not it either. Here we go. I've got it. Which practices for restorative, which restorative practices are you using or embedding right now? Which are the ones that are important to you? Great. You guys are really quick on the responses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this. This is pretty cool. Restorative hula hoop. That's not even real, you guys. <laughs> I'm so glad this is recorded, Anthony and Diane. Great. I want you to look, we have a larger proportion of folks using effective language circles for community building. Restorative chats, which would be those sentence starters that our grown-ups can use to say, what was going on, Jessica? What were you thinking at the time? How do I help you do something different, right? So a series of questions that we ask. Restorative conferencing are, are harder and restorative circles are harder. And um, we have to have a certain level of clinical skill to do that. For those of you that are doing restorative conferencing and restorative circles, who is leading? Who's facilitating that? If you if you selected restorative circles or restorative conferencing, who's facilitating? Like which person in your building 
or district is leading that. Okay, multiple folks are responding. And while they're responding, the reason I'm asking is I said this before at the beginning, down here, we all do this all the time. This is our job, specifically for all kids. When as those things are not working, we add more for the kiddos who have a little bit of the more advanced needs, the same way we would give extra practice or a different reading group, an additional reading group for kids who need support. And then we have this very higher level of clin almost clinical and actually in some cases very clinical um, interventions that we put in place for our kids. And so <clears throat> what I really want to know is that uh, is that the people, the reason I was asking you who is doing it is that I want those people to have the training and the resources to do that. I really need you for you to avoid things like there's an, a bullying or a sexual harassment incident and you decide just to pull both of those kids in and have them talk uh, just on a whim. You're gonna pull them in and talk to them and you're gonna work it out, okay? No, wait. Think about power differential, think about readiness, think about victim being re-victimized. That's just one example of what I want you to be very worried about and predict and prevent, right? What do you do if a kiddo discloses in a restorative uh, chat or conference that there is a lot of bad things going on in their lives? What do you do then? What are the resources that you can pull in? So I want you to be thinking about the level of training and support the people who are doing this higher level restorative work have, the same way you would think about the people who are doing, who are facilitating complex function-based behavior support plans or wraparound support or renew, okay? And that's what I just said. <laughs> I, I'm so good at talking ahead of my slides. So we, we provide the most training and support, okay, to people who are doing the highest level of work. Um, I would like to know um, what, if we're gonna, if we're gonna ask people to do this, we have to be able to evaluate the impact of interest. And some of you already told me how you're doing that, which is which is great. Um, what I want to know uh, is is how specifically, what are the data that you're collecting to show impact? And so if you've said, uh, if, if your interest in restorative is that kids will feel a sense of belonging, you have to measure that. If you're looking to reduce uh, office referrals for harassment, you can measure that. Okay, and do you have the data that you need? So you don't have to tell me that. Whatever your goal is, you have to be able to assess the impact on those goals. And you may have multiple goals. I had a district tell me two weeks ago, their first goal is to build teacher knowledge of restorative practices. So that's the first thing that they measure. We often need some baby steps. Now, some of us go right to the end, end outcomes. Those are fairly distal outcomes are fairly far away. So you can't move this all the time unless you have the data that come before that. Do teachers understand? How much are they using it? Do we have contraindicated practices happening? Those are the baby steps that get us to the outcomes we want for our kiddos. And, and using the practices with staff is, uh, is one way to see if they're willing to engage. But actually being able to identify what they're doing in the classroom and if it's what we need them to do in the classroom, that's part of those baby steps and when we're building our fluency. And there are different things that people measure and that they're interested in measuring and, and there are various ways to do that. If you are struggling with, a, with a, a validated measure or needing suggestions for how to evaluate something through this process, please do uh, grab my email at the end and, and, and give me a shout out because we could be able to, um, might be able to get you connected with someone or share uh, some measures. So Stephanie is saying that there's no sound right now. Um, Amy's reaffirming, thank you, people are reaffirming. So Stephanie, I'm sorry, maybe it's just Long Island right now. I don't know about that. We already did this. So you notice I've neglected fidelity and clearly that means that there's something wrong with me. I talked about it a little bit uh, throughout. So this, this woman here is, is very perplexed because I, I mean, I've got like a big fidelity tattoo. I don't actually, that would be really funny and sad. So I won't do that. But uh, systems and practices fidelity, we start with our systems fidelity because this is our framework. It's our basket to put everything into. 
And what I'm seeing is that as, as schools add increasingly complex interventions and strategies, if, it, if it's hard at tier one, it's much harder at tier two, it's much harder at tier three, okay? So when we're asking schools to add more mental health strategies, for example, or restorative strategies or to address trauma, they're like, wow, we really aren't doing the system thing very well. So I, I want you to first, you know, if you're at the district level, look at your district capacity assessment. That's something I can help your district or folks on my team can help your district take. It's, it's about building capacity. And, and so this is the really big basket we put everything in. Um, and then at the school level, we can look at our PBS uh, fidelity, uh, the tiered fidelity inventory, which I really like. Um, but the tiered fidelity inventory will tell us the, the robustness of our systems across tiers one, two, and three. And then if we're gonna, when we back down to that practice level, that interaction between a teacher and a student, um, I, I want you to work with your local trainer. I want you to use your PBIS lens. So is this contraindicated? Or are we supposed to be yelling at kids? That's not what I signed up for. That's not restorative or, or positive. Um, and use your data to tell you if it's working. And then I want you to tweak what you're doing and document that. So no, not twerking, Diane. We're not dancing on the dance floor today. But, but you know, beef it up, change it, modify something in a documented way. So that way you can say, well, this is the change that we made and, and this is what we're getting now. And as a reminder, in, in our school-wide information system, if you're using check and check out function or the individual student functions, you can insert that change line and say, this is when we did something different. But that's one of those um, data systems that will allow us to document that. Um, for our school-wide, our action plan and our, and our notes that we keep as our log um, as, a, as a tier one team, we're updating our action plan, that's where we can document that. So your, your local trainer um, should be able to tell you what something looks like when it's done right. And your job is to, is to boil that down into a fidelity measure. Now, um, a checklist. Now, yes, uh, uh, Jeff Sprague, Terry Tobin, and myself have developed uh, fidelity measures. And I'm going to give you a little story about that that will take uh, 10 seconds. Brian Meyer is going to time me right now. So um, last year, the community of practice for restorative practices was rolled out. And I had asked people to take the fidelity measure and be part of a team to validate that. And what we found is that people didn't have anything in place. And they were hoping the fidelity measure would teach them how to do it. And that's not what that is for. <laughs> the fidelity measure is not everything that needs to be included. It's some big pieces, like some of the core features that need to be there. If you are in doing restorative and you are interested in, in truly sharing data, a de-identified, but sharing data, sharing your story, and taking the fidelity measure, you are welcome to contact me. I will set that up. It is free. There's, there's nothing proprietary about this. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. This is, is truly to advance the field and collaboratively make something better and easier for our schools. Um, so I'm going to ask if Brian or Diane will write my email address in the chat pod as I motor on to the exemplars. So Champaign uh, School District number four, Jill Matthews Johnson, has done a great job bringing PBS and restorative um, into, uh, in particular, Garden Hills Elementary School. A little bit about their, their uh, makeup here. And I want you to just get a visual for what they have put at the different tiers and how restorative in the red has fit into their existing intervention. So before I kind of gave you the generic one, this is actually how it was um, implemented. And thank you, Brian, for throwing my email address in there. I really appreciate that. Um, so there's a lot here, uh, which is great. We have multiple ways to support and reinforce the, the skill building for our kiddos. Um, Jill was very clear to, to she really defined and, and gave people how to do these things. I mean, they had very specific time for circles in the morning. They had very specific topics. They used their social emotional learning lessons and their PBS cool tools or lesson plans. Uh, and they also had um, the classroom teacher could pick and they gave the teacher a list of things the teachers could talk about and do. So very prescriptive, nothing willy nilly. Um, same thing about the restorative chat. Okay, so there was very clear flow chart. If you think about right now, you have their classroom flow chart, your school wide flow chart for corrections and reteaching. 
it, this would go right into that flow chart. Okay, I want you to look quickly at their changes in referrals. This is really huge. This is number of referrals. Yes, this actually is uh, getting close to 2,500. Would you think about that for a second? It's a lot of power, a lot of saved time and instruction. Waverly Hills Middle School, this is a school that um, I want you to, what I, the big takeaway from them is that they built their school-wide practices. They really focused on classroom management strategies for their teachers. And then they added the Responsible Thinking Center and Restorative Strategies. They built and added the same way that Jill's team at Garden Hills built and added. Okay, if I have a chaotic classroom or I use shame as a teacher to manage my kids, it doesn't matter that I sent Jessica out to the Responsible Thinking Center. She may have gotten some support there. When she came back, it wasn't, she couldn't use it. There is no space for that. And it's important that there's space at all of our levels for our kids to go back and make those connections. The power of school wide PBS is to create consistent adult behaviors and language so that there are fewer extraneous stimulus features for my behavior analysts out there. The relevant stimulus features of how I behave and when I behave and what happens are continual, consistent. Okay? Yes, David, schools are working restorative language into their matrices. I love that question. In the school-wide matrices and the classroom matrices. So respect looks like taking care of myself and others. Respect looks like using this type of language, right? So those things are being built in there. That's a great question. A little bit more about how they addressed and, and taught addressed that curriculum for their staff. They really coached their teachers on classroom management. They, they worked with them to create the lessons and the formats for, for teaching these things. Uh, there was not just a, a one-size-fits-all approach. And they took this classic timeout room or in-school suspension room, and they turned it into that responsible thinking center. So they had different things in place. It was designed to get kids back to class as quickly as possible. Now. This room would be overrun without the classroom foundation and the management strategies in place. Okay, this class, this responsible thinking room represents additional problem solving and additional time for a kiddo to engage with a grown up on the same strategies and um, approach that the teacher is using. This kiddo simply needs more time in this moment to get refocused and to go back and participate and be part of that classroom. OK, that's really important. These are not holding cells. Here there's referrals going down over time. It's pretty phenomenal. And another really phenomenal piece is their increases in academics. And I've seen this in high schools. They get PBS in place. Office of referrals start going down. They start having increases in proficiency for state testing. This is really astounding. They go from 60 to 40% to 65% for eighth grade students meeting or exceeding reading proficiencies. Now, this took three years to see this decrease. It took three years. I was going to ask you, but we have six minutes left. It took three years because changing adult behaviors to be consistent takes some time, right? So you can challenge your staff and see how quickly they can do it. Um, that might be, you know, staff beat the party or, hey, you know, reserve the local pub or something for meeting those goals. Make sure those nachos, nachos are just the best. But this is something we can anticipate. And logically, we save instructional time. Kids have more opportunity to engage. They're more willing to engage because of the safe space to risk academic failure. They're going to learn more. So we can logically make that connection. And we do have substantial evidence in PBS world of, um, of grades increasing. Um, over time, proficiency increasing over time uh, because of that consistency of adult behaviors. So here are the big, the big lessons learned. For our exemplars, they, they both built and strengthened school-wide. And this is something that I'm seeing in the school climate site right now, is that this really is lending itself to, to motivating the district, the school, to provide increasing support for classroom management strategies and that follow-through. 
They implemented restorative practices thoughtfully. They didn't just throw everything in the basket at once. They did it step by step as part of other components in the school. And they really established the tier one and tier three practices almost simultaneously for slowing office referrals. So teacher strategies to redirect and reteach, right? To slow kids out of the room. And then slowing suspension at the tier three level, those kids are coming in for repeated behaviors. Instead of uh, automatic suspension, there's that plan development, restorative plan development, incorporating what we know about PBS and our PBS components, so function-based thinking, some person-centered approaches there. They attended multiple and ongoing trainings. They established FTE for coaches. Um, they used the current data to track their outcomes. So Brad's asking, tell me about the stop and think cards, which was one of these over here. The stop and think cards are the restorative chat questions. So what happened? What were you thinking at the time? Who did it impact? How can we do things differently? How can I help you? So that's what they, they had those restorative questions. Okay. So I am looking for exemplars. I'd love to hear what you're doing. And I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm always willing to get on a webinar, talk on the phone with district and school staff. I really enjoy that. And I really am interested in, in folks that are committed to collecting data to help move this along. So the restorative, the restorative practice, uh, community practice will start up again this fall. Um, we've had some space to learn some things. I think those, those uh, webinars will be even, even better. They'll be even in more engaging. Please do email me um, if you are interested in doing that. Here's a list of some resources. Here's my contact information as well as Jill. Jill has offered up her contact information for folks needing who'd like more. Uh, we have the, if you, so the work on aligning. Um, we have our ISF monograph. Also on PBIS.org, there is a brief on the alignment process. Look at various initiative to mer initiatives to merge them together so you can hold on to the core features of what we know works. IBARGE, IARP, and the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice. You have been very interactive today, and I really appreciate that in the chat pod. Um, if you're looking for additional uh, references, we have last two slides of some references that you can look at. Something I want to point out is this Macintosh um, et al. article on sustained implementation. There are some important factors to think about in sustaining anything, really. Um, we have our um, what further research is needed on restorative practices. So depending on your level of, in, of uh, implementation, Terry may actually be on the call, Terry Berkowitz. Um, we have links to uh, various resources through school districts. Kent. <laughs> well, we have resources to different school districts. Uh, we have resources to um, what we know about PBIS being an evidence-based practice. Okay. And then again, some some clicks you can add, you can take here to get you directly to some of the resources I mentioned at the beginning. That is all I have for you today, and I am really appreciative that you took a time an hour out of your day to join. I'm going to hang out for a little bit. I'd love it if you put additional questions or comments in that chat pod, um, and please do reach out if you have questions or would like some resources. Um, and make sure that your uh, email address is in that sign-in pod for us. That way, if you would like me to contact you and say, hey, this other thing is coming up, we can do that. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to go through and see if there are additional questions or comments that I missed out on. But otherwise, please enjoy the rest of your day and have a great Friday tomorrow.